Okay, um, thank you, Nikhil, and thanks to the uh, organizers. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about some uh, capacity bounds that are different than the capacity bounds I typically talk about. Um, and uh, this is very recent work with Leonid Gervitz. Um, and so this this talk is not, I mean, the, the even there should be a, a more up-to-date archive post here, I don't know, in the next day or two. Um, and so this is sort of ongoing, so that you can keep that in the back of your mind as, uh, I go through this. Okay, so here's the outline. I'm going to talk about uh, what what we what we try to do. The main technical result. Discuss uh, the two main applications or possible applications. I'll talk more about that. Uh, give a sense of the proof, and then talk about last some some questions that we still have. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So if you haven't seen capacity. Uh, this is what it is for the purpose of this talk. Sometimes that one, that bold one there is, is a different vector, but for us, we're just going to be looking at the all ones capacity. So you have some polynomial non-negative coefficients, and you're looking at this infimum over the strict positive orthant of the polynomial divided by this product of the inputs. And there are a lot of applications to uh, certain bounds you can get on things or approximations for things. There's, there's yeah, a number of things. You can see the first, uh, the first, like, oh, Right. You can see the first uh, few things in the, in the list are things related to counting things on graphs or, or sort of nearby things to graphs. The second part there um, is related to matroids and doing optimization on matroids or, or counting uh, bases in matroids. Um, and then uh, there's also been some recent applications to operator scaling and invariant theory more generally with a bunch of papers with some combination of those authors there. Uh, there's, there's probably more things on this list that I that I haven't written down, um, and if if I've forgotten you, you know, please feel free to send me a frustrated email, and I will most certainly uh, rectify that and uh, read your paper. Okay. Okay. So I'm I'm not going to talk too much of these. I'm just going to kind of talk about what sort of things are needed for these, and and almost always you need some kind of log concavity condition. This is going to be similar to to the polynomials that uh, Chris talked about at the beginning of his talk. So Pretty much every application that I know either uses real stable polynomials or some kind of log concave polynomial. So real stable, um, if you haven't seen it, is just that you have a polynomial with real coefficients. And whenever you plug in entries uh, which have complex part in the upper, uh, sorry, positive imaginary part, uh, you always get something that's non-zero. OK? So uh, when, when p is univariate, it's easy to see that this just means that p has only real roots. Um, and you have this very old result from Newton that says you have a certain log concavity property of the coefficients of such polynomials. And these are generalized in the strong Rayleigh inequalities for more general real stable polynomials. But you should think of this these as sort of log concave properties. And you also have this property, uh, this log concavity in the positive orthant. Okay, and generalizing uh, real stable polynomials are strongly log concave polynomials, which th that term was originally coined uh, by Gervitz. And his, his definition was given in this way, which is you take any number of directional derivatives in the positive orthant, and the thing you always have at the end is log concave in the positive orthant. Um, and these polynomials, uh, I mean, as you saw before, connect, are connected to matroids quite a bit. Um, and also the- well, Jonathan, yes. just a minute. Your volume is going up and down very, in pre well, not continuously. Okay. Let me, uh, if I talk like this, is it is it good? I, maybe I'm moving closer and away from the microphone or something. Let me try to. Yes, maybe you should move closer because I have to. Move uh, closer, is that is that better? Yeah. Okay. Okay, then let me uh, let me just stay here then. Um, okay, so, so you saw in the previous talk, uh, there's a lot of connections to matroids. Um, there's also connections, like I said, to the Alexander Finkel inequalities, um, volume polynomials. That That term was used in the last talk for something specific, but also uh, polynomials coming from volumes of convex bodies also um, have this property. And also this, this property has a couple different names. So uh, these two recent collections of papers, either completely log concave or Lorentzian, both of these papers uh, prove these Mason's conjectures that were talked about previously. And also uh, a number of other things are proven about these polynomials there. Um, so this, the, these, these polynomials have been, have been studied very, you know, strongly recently, um, and they have a lot of 
applications. Okay. So these are going to be the type of polynomials we're looking at. For the most part, we're just going to be looking at real stable things, but there's also connections to these other strongly log k as well. Okay, so let's go back to, to this capacity. And we're going to interpret some things probabilistically and, uh, and then use some different kind of notation for things based on that. So let's say we have some polynomial p. And let's suppose that when we plug in the all ones vector, we get 1. Okay, So that just means the sum of the coefficients is 1. And they're all non-negative. So we can think of p as being the generating, some kind of generating function for a probability distribution on its support. So I'm going to think of its support as a collection of integer vectors, which are the sort of degree vectors for the terms that appear in this polynomial. And the idea is that if, if kappa is some degree vector that appears, then we're going to assign probability to, to corresponding coefficient to that kappa. Okay. And if you think about this probability distribution and you look at the expectation of it, um, you're basically looking at a weighted sum of the degree of each variable. And what this boils down to is just taking the gradient and plugging in one. So if you have some you know, x1 cubed showing up in one term, you want to add that to the expectation of mu1 with a weight of 3, because the 3 is the power. And so by taking gradient, right, the derivatives pull that 3 down and, and give you the right weightings. Okay, so I'm going to use the word marginals to refer to this. But it, but it has a, you know, on the left-hand side, you have like the polynomial interpretation. On the right-hand side, you have the probabilistic interpretation. And so another feature of capacity in terms of these probabilistic notions. So the first thing, it's pretty straightforward to see that Capacity, capacity in this case is going to be between 0 and 1. Okay, The 0 is because the coefficients are non-negative. 1 because when you plug in all 1s, you get 1. And it's a pretty uh, standard fact at this point that um, it's going to be strictly positive if and only if 1 is in the Newton polytope of p, which is just the convex hull of the support. But the thing that's going to be more important to us is this fact, the fact that it will be maximized, the capacity will, will be the largest value it can possibly be whenever the marginals, this expectation here, is equal to the all ones vector. Okay. And in particular, I, I am probably assuming, I might be assuming like the that there are n variables degree n, the polynomial. I, I, I'm going to be assuming that throughout, but just for now, we'll just say this. Um, and I'll, I'll say that stuff more formally later. But in this case, we're going to call the polynomial p doubly stochastic, okay, for reasons we'll, we'll see later, or maybe you already have seen them. Okay, so we have this property. We have some exact value of the capacity whenever the marginals is 1. But the question that, that uh, Leonid and I then were looking at is the following. What happens if the marginals are only close to the all ones vector? And the point of this is somehow there's a couple ways maybe to think about why you want to ask this question. Arrhythmically, um, you know, you, you can't necessarily guarantee that you're going to have some exact knowledge of something. Maybe you only have like kind of approximate knowledge or a lot of times algorithms that, that, that use capacity are sort of iterative algorithms that get closer and closer to something. And so you need to be able to know that, that this, that this idea that the, that the capacity is one is sort of continuous. And we know, we know that it's continuous, but we need to know, we need to know how, how continuous it is, how badly can the capacity, how small can the capacity get the further away we get from the all ones vector for the marginals. Okay, so that brings us to our main result, which is this. So like I said, we're making this assumption about p. It is homogeneous. It has n variables, and its degree is also equal to n. Okay, it has this probabilistic property that the coefficient sum to 1. We assume p is real stable, and then we have this bound on the marginals. Okay, it's it only differs from the all ones vector in one norm, uh, well by by some number, but that's less than two. And when you have this, you get this lower bound on the capacity. And you, you can see just from the bound, like if it's if it's two or greater, this bound is is meaningless. So this bound only makes sense for that uh, when the marginals are close to one. Okay, so this tells you, right, as you go away from the all ones vector, this is the the, the most your capacity can decrease. 
And a lot of times when you're using capacity, uh, we care about coefficient bounds. And so if you combine this with Gervitz's original coefficient capacity bound, which is the left inequality here, it just says that the coefficient corresponding to the all ones degree uh, vector is bounded below by this van der Waarden constant times the capacity. And if you just combine these together, you get this lower bound here for that coefficient. You need P to have non-negative coefficients as well, right? Uh, yeah, did I not say that? Yes, I, okay, I'm, uh, that, that'll be something that I'm, that I'm assuming throughout, but you are correct, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the main result, and that's the main kind of uh, sorry, coefficient corollary that we're going to use. Any questions before I move on further than that? And the assumption is that P is real stable? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah, on okay. the, yeah. In the corollary, yeah. Also in the corollary, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's the same assumptions, including this assumption that the coefficients are not negative. Okay. So in fact, I think if P is not real stable, this is, it can, it can be a zero, unless it yeah. is equal to one. That was the point. Yeah, so, so if, if, if P is not real stable, if P is just general, I would assume that you, yeah, you cannot get anything of this sort. I mean, you're, you're saying something more about whether or not, like how weird the Newton polytope can get for a general polynomial, which I'm imagining it can get like weird enough to where I, I think you can get exponentially close to all ones and still have it be outside the Newton polytope or something. I, I don't know that as much, but yeah, for non-real stable, this should be this should be wrong, pretty pretty easily. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, how we can apply this to certain situations. Okay, so the first one is is a matrix matrix scaling. So the idea of matrix scaling is you have some uh, square matrix in our case A with non-negative entries. And we want to find some diagonal positive matrices that we can multiply on the left and right uh, to make A doubly stochastic, which just means that the row sums and the column sums of A are all one. So this is the scaling problem. Okay. And the idea that's typically used for this, and this has a, a long history, um, is you have this iterative algorithm where you, okay, so I have some row sums and some column sums. So the first thing I'm going to do is, is multiply by something to make the rows all uh, all the row sums equal to one. Okay, then I need to fix the column sums, so I go over and make the column sums one. Well, that screws up the rows, so I make the row sums one, that screws up the columns, and I keep going back and forth like this. Okay, and, and you know, I mean, in theory, this might not do anything. Um, you know, maybe you'll just kind of go back and forth forever, but it's pretty well known at this point that uh, pretty much this is going to converge if and only if uh, your permanent is positive. Um, and in fact, this, this type of thing was used uh, for the permanent of, a, of one of these matrices in 2000. Let's be able to approximate it within an e to the n factor. Okay, and how did they do that? Well, okay, the first thing to note is whenever you multiply, whenever you do this kind of, you know, alternating thing, when you multiply on one side by some diagonal matrix, uh, the change in the permanent is just a determinant of that diagonal matrix. So it's easy to keep track of how this is changing the permanent over time. Okay. When you finally, uh, quote, arrive at a doubly stochastic matrix, uh, we have this van der Waarden bound, okay, that tells us we have some e to the n approximation in that case. And so now the only thing we have to worry about is, well, we know we're never going to, you know, this is some, this is some sequence of events. We're never going to actually get to the doubly stochastic thing, but we're going to get pretty close, at least in the case when, you know, the permanent is positive. And so what they use is they use some kind of bound when the matrix is close to doubly stochastic. And this is very similar to things that have been done in, in operator scaling stuff recently, but they have this bound that says, if you have some matrix A with row sums one and the column sums are C, if you have this two norm bound, uh, of the column sums in terms of their closeness to one, it implies some lower bound of the permanent, okay, which looks very similar to the to our main result from the from the previous slide. Okay, so let's see then how our bound relates to this. Okay, so how are we going to apply it? We're going to use this very standard technique, which is we take a matrix A and we turn it into this product polynomial. That's where this productization in the in the title comes from, which will be talked about later. 
but it's referring to these product polynomials, which are products of linear forms coming from the rows of the matrix A. So you dot each row with a vector of variables, and then you product those together. And it turns out that the all ones coefficient of this polynomial is just the permanent of this original matrix. Okay. And now, if you think about what, you know, if you're looking at row sums and column sums of this matrix, well, the row sums being one just means that if I plug in all ones, I'm just going to be getting a product of ones. And the column sums are just exactly equal to the marginals of this polynomial or the associated distribution. Okay, so putting that all together, we can now use our bound. Okay, our bound is, of course, in terms of the one norm, but just using normal, if you can, you know, you can just use normal uh, inequalities between one and two norms to get the following. So our bound then implies that if, if we have this inequality between the all ones vector and the marginals, then we get this lower bound on the permanent. And the key improvement here is the fact that we get this two showing up instead of a one, um, which before you just had a one in both of these places, which is the worst bound. And of course, our bound is our bound is better if you use the one norm, but this is just showing how it gives a core, gives something stronger uh, in terms of the two norm also. Okay. And like I said, this is also used more recently for operator and tensor scaling. Same kind of thing. You have this algorithm that eventually you get close, and if you're close enough, you need some kind of bound like this to give to give what you want. Okay. So any questions about that? Okay. And and the other thing I'll say here is that the the one norm bound that we have is is, is tight for real stable. Uh, I don't know about this two norm bound. I don't know about its tightness, um, but uh, but the one norm bound, is, at least for our context. Okay. Okay. So now the the other application, which this is a little more, I will say that this it's not as clear. This is a little more, I would say, ongoing thinking that's going on. Um, but I will show you what we have here. So um, this metric traveling salesperson problem uh, is, you know, the, the standard kind of toy version or, or real version, whatever you want to say, is that you have like a bunch of cities in a country and you have roads between them and you're a person going around selling things to people and you want to go to every city and return home and travel the least amount of distance. Okay. And this is one of these classic uh, NP hard problems. Oh, and by the way, this metric word just means that the triangle inequality holds. That's what that means. Uh, this is one of these classic NP-hard problems, uh, and even approximation within a, a small factor is, is NP-hard, okay? But um, in the 70s, uh, an approximation uh, uh, algorithm with approximation factor three halves was given, um, and I'm, I'm not going to, I'm just going to very kind of hand wave all of this. The, the general algorithm is that you first pick a minimum spanning tree, spanning tree of minimum weight, and then you add sort of a minimum weight matching on the odd degree vertices of the tree, and you put these two together, and you get this path that this salesperson is going to take. Um, and very recent work, which we're going to hear about on Friday, <clears throat> has improved this factor to something slightly lower than three halves. Okay, and the, and the, the main change from what I can gather is that, the, that instead of doing the minimum spanning tree, you have this random spanning tree based on this linear relaxation. So Instead of thinking of spanning trees as, uh, you can think of them as lattice points and you take their convex hole, you have this polytope and you do some kind of optimization problem over that polytope and then you get a distribution on the spanning trees and you randomly select one. So this is a randomized algorithm. But uh, using that change, you can improve this factor. Uh, and that factor may look, you know, small, the, the improvement, but uh, this is the first general improvement, to my knowledge, of this of this problem. So there have been a lot of there are a lot of been a lot of things done in special cases. But in terms of improving this algorithm from 40 or 50 years ago, this is the first time in general that, that this was able to be done. And like I said, I I, I will admit my knowledge on this on this uh, improvement and and the problem is is not very big. Uh, and so you should definitely listen to the talk on Friday that's actually about this improvement. But I'm just going to now shift gears to connections to to our bound. Okay. So I'm going to start from a place that that's that where our bound starts to become important in their paper. Okay. So we're going to have some distribution on on the power set of one through m. So we're picking some random subset of one through m. 
And to this distribution, we're going to sort of do the reverse thing that we did before, right? We had a polynomial, we made it into a distribution. We're going to, we're going to do the reverse thing. And so we're going to come up, we're going to have this polynomial Q, which we're going to sum over all possible subsets. And the coefficient for that subset is just going to be the probability of that subset. And the term will be this Y to the S just means product together all the variables that, that come from S. Okay, so this is not homogeneous. Um, and so that's going to be something we're going to have to try to deal with. Okay, we have this polynomial. Okay, and one example that's particularly pertinent to this situation is if, for instance, you let your set one through m be the edges of some graph, you look at the uniform distribution on spanning trees and make a polynomial out of that, you get something real stable. And in fact, also, you can have your probabilities be according to, um, like, you can add some extra factor that products together positive constants of edges from the tree. So, so there's some kind of tweak you can do of just the uniform distribution, and you also get something real stable. And there are, uh, you know, a huge number of examples for this. These are the two I'm going to point out because of their relation to um, this situation. Okay. And now the other thing we're going to do is, and this is this is where they start to need to do something like our bound. We're going to, if you pick disjoint sets that whose whose uh, union is the whole of M, we're going to make these new random variables, which are summing the underlying distribution random variables from each subset. And what this means is if you pick some random X from one through M, according to new, then the random variable AI is just counting the number of elements of X that come from SI. Okay. And with this, this comes to the main line of their paper that we are going to investigate, which is this. So when Q is real stable, they show that when you have some bound on the expectation of this, of these AIs, it gives some bound on the probability that those AIs are all ones. Okay, and they get some lower bound that is doubly exponential in N, but has no, which N again was the number of subsets that we broke the S, S1 through SN, and M was the number of elements in our ground set at the beginning. So what we're going to do now, which is what we did before, is we're going to translate this into a, polyn a more polynomial statement that we can do something with. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is we take our polynomial Q. And for every, for every fixed set SI, we look at all the Js within SI. And all of those variables we just set to the same variable, Xi. So somehow this is taking all the variables according to each of these SI sets and just turning them into a single variable. And when you do this, right, well, this is now going to drop this P tilde now has just n variables according to the subsets. Um, the degrees are the same. Okay. And now the marginals of this new polynomial are exactly the expectation of A. In fact, the distribution corresponding to P tilde, like we saw at the beginning of the talk, is just A1 through AN. So somehow we've constructed a polynomial that is associated directly to this random variable A. So we have that our marginals are what we would want them to be, this expectation. And now the all ones coefficient, again, because this is associated to this distribution A, is just the probability that A is the all ones vector. OK, so if we then translate this statement into language closer to something we can work with, it's just this. So they show that when this polynomial is real stable, if your marginals are close to all ones, then you get a lower bound on this coefficient, which is exactly the sort of thing we can do. Okay, so let's see then what we get. Okay, so here's our bound that we proved that we showed before. Okay, how can we apply this? So this is the thing we actually want. This is the thing they show. And there are a few problems. So the, the first problem is P tilde isn't homogeneous and it's its number of variables is, is a lot lower than its potential total degree. So we need to do some kind of transformation to line that all up. Uh, and there's a way you can do this. You can homogenize and kind of add a lot of variables, like a sum of variables in that, in that extra homogenous variable. And there's some transformations you can do to get to the situation so that we can apply this. And the other thing we have to deal with is the fact that our, our bound has this two and somehow there's this one minus epsilon, but 
that also comes out in the homogenization. You add this extra variable, that sort of takes one of the, you know, it drops two to one somehow. So this all works and we can all put this together. And the thing we eventually get is this, okay, we get this lower bound on the coefficient, but the problem with this is that D, at least a priori, could be equal to M, right? And we wanted to avoid dependence on M, which we could not. So in some cases when D is, is small or close to N, this, this of course improves upon the doubly exponential, but uh, again, I, I, I'm a little, I don't exactly know, this is still kind of work in progress. Um, I, I don't know how actually applicable that is. I'm assuming not very. Um, but the thought is that probably if we sort of rework this whole thing from a different perspective, where instead of starting off with degree n homogeneous and variables, we sort of start off with, with their um, starting case, the hope would be that uh, these arguments would lead to better bounds. Um, and this is kind of what happens in Gervitz's original capacity bound, if you're familiar, his original bound was four this exact type of situation, homogeneous degree equals number of variables. But it turns out actually you can generalize this to non-homogeneous thing, uh, non-homogeneous polynomials, and the bound still only depends on the number of variables, which is exactly the sort of thing we'd want here. So this is the kind of like open part. We, 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 don't, we don't know, but our, everything we have so far is before we make this application is tight. Can we tweak things to make this work? Uh, currently unclear, um, but that that is that is uh, yeah. That, so that's kind of what we're what we're doing here. So that's the end of the discussion of that. Um, it's unfortunate that the metric TSP talk didn't come before this because uh, I think it's made pretty clear that you know I, I haven't really fully grokked uh, what's going on in that paper, um, and so I just sort of stuck to what I knew. Um, but anyway, so any any questions before I before I move on? So there's just a few minutes left, maybe like three or four, depending on maybe three or whatever, whenever we started a little bit late. Um, so let me just quickly talk a little bit about the proof. Okay. So the proof outline is going to go like this. So we talked about these product polynomials. You have some non-negative entry matrix A. That's just a product of linear forms like this. Uh, we're always going to assume the row sums are one, which means that P of one equals one. And when the column sums are alpha, we're going to use this notation. The PA comes from this space, product N alpha. Okay. And the column sums, like you saw before, are exactly the marginals in this polynomial. Okay. So there are two theorems that come together to make this work. The first one is we prove our bound for product polynomials. So this is just a rewording of the original bound, just not for real stable, for product polynomials. Okay. And then the way that we're going to put this all together is we're going to prove this productization result. Okay, so if you have one of these polynomials P that's real stable and has all the various properties that we that we usually are assuming, and you fix any X in the strict positive orthant, then we can always find some product polynomial with the same marginals such that these polynomials coincide at this point. Okay, and in a sense, at least, to me, sometimes when I look at this, it feels innocuous. Like, oh, okay, we just need to get these things to agree at one point. Find some polynomial that makes them agree at one point. But the thing is, this essentially, once you have this bound for product polynomials, being able to do this sort of thing, this productization result, gives you the bound for whatever class of polynomials you can do this for. And we know that this bound shouldn't be true in general. So this is definitely not going to be true for general polynomials. Real stability crucially comes into play to make this happen. Um, so PA is a function of X here, right? PA is, is this polynomial. Yeah, sorry, A is, yes, correct. Yes, yes, you are correct. Uh, for every X, there is a PA, yeah. So that, that's the thing that makes this feel innocuous, at least to me. Because once you pick the X, you can pick any polynomial to make this work. But if you think about the, the reason why this is going to give you the bound for real stable is because if you think about what this min of capacity is up here, you can just think of that as an inf of an inf of some expression. And so you can take the inner inf and move it out. And now once you move the inner inf out, which is inf over x greater than zero, you can just fix one, show that the inner inf you can change from product to real stable, 
and then switch them again. So th this productization result ex is exactly the sort of thing you need to be able to generalize this product polynomial bound to any class. If you can get this for any class, then, then you, you get the bound for that class. Okay. And I don't have too much time it looks like. So let me just show you these next few proof slides just, just to sort of give you a sense of what's going on. So the main lemma for this, so this is proving the, the bound for product polynomials. Essentially we show that we kind of show like a weaker version of our bound, which is that this condition on the this this condition one in the lemma, which is the the bound that we need to assume uh, to get our lower bound, show, implies that the that the min capacity is positive. So this is like a you know we get an actual lower bound in the in the result. So this is kind of a first step, um, and, and that's equivalent to the permanent also being positive. And essentially, the idea of the proof, if you look at this, is that you kind of subtract off the lowest, the kind of the biggest doubly stochastic matrix you can. This enforces that the permanent has to be zero. That allows you to get some bound on the column sums, according to this lemma. And then, because we know capacity of doubly stochastic matrices is easy, this then gives you some lower bound on the original matrix. So that's a very hand wavy argument. It's, it's sort of given a little more detail there. And this condition three in the lemma is not really useful, uh, at least for this argument. Um, but I put it there because it has this kind of reminiscence to the, to the, you know, the Hall condition. Um, and so I thought that would be it's kind of interesting that it appears here as well. And then the last part is the productization part. And the main lemma for that is due to Petter. Okay. And the idea is that you take one of these polynomials P we care about, you say that its marginals are already all ones vectors, so it's doubly stochastic as a polynomial. You look at the roots in some direction, and you always get that the input vector majorizes the roots of that linear restriction. And if you, the majorization relation gives you a doubly stochastic matrix, right? It says that there's a doubly stochastic matrix D such that DX equals lambda X. And then you can kind of do some algebra and some perturbation argument to route this in to get kind of, you can, I guess you can just make this work for not just uh, all ones marginals. So you first do it for rational, you do some transformation like this, it turns it into doubly stochastic, you use the lemma, and then you sort of sum blocks together. And then once you have everything rational, you use some perturbation argument to get irrational alpha. Okay, so I, I spent less time on these last two slides than I would have liked to, but you know, it is what it is. Um, okay, and then the open questions are mainly, okay, right, we, you know, I, I sort of showed how you could route this to get to try to get some kind of improved t bound for this TSP uh, inequality. It doesn't really improve it in the way that we'd hoped, but, but, the, but we do think that if you sort of start off with the right context, the, the ideas should help to get something better. Um, another question is, can you extend these as strong log and k polynomials? So the, this lemma of of Petter Brenden that we used required, right? It sort of inherently requires on requires roots, which you know, which you don't have in the strongly locked and cave case. Um, is there some other argument that would make this work? And also, like I said, this is very new. Uh, we had some applications in mind when we were writing this, but are there other applications of this that we haven't thought of? Uh, and that's it. Thanks a lot. Nice talk. Question from the audience. So I mean, I think naturally it should generalize, but uh, you should be able to extend to any integer vector, right? Not just the all one vector. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think, I think that that's also true. Um, we haven't thought too much about that, but I would be surprised if that didn't work. Um, you mean like integer vector and also change the capacity vector to be that integer vector? Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. I think that I think that that should I think that that should work. Uh, I mean, we haven't. I don't think we've explicitly thought about it, but yeah. So I I agree I, that that should work. Um, and and you could say that like when you homogenize, you know, you you then want to look at this vector of all ones with an extra like big factor. But I think even if you do the naive thing, and just extend our result to integer vectors, I, I still think that what you end up getting um, for the lower bound still depends on d, which at least and again I you know maybe we can talk about this offline or something. But you know, uh, this dependence on the degree of the polynomial seems. To, to have to be there. I know that that's, that's not true in some of Gervitz's results. So, you know, maybe it doesn't, but I, I still don't exactly know how that dependence on the degree, how, 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 how necessary that is. I, I, we, we don't know. I have a basic question. Okay. So uh, if you fix the marginals and look at the possible, and you fix the x and you look at the possible values of p of x, is that a convex set? Is that an interval? Well, so I think that that, that at least in the case that we look at, so uh, I'm, let's see. So I think that that has to be true by, uh, okay, well, maybe it doesn't, yeah, no, no, I think it has to be true by that productization result, because I think in the productization case, you're looking at some sort of projection of like the set of all matrices with row sums one and column sums like fixed. And so I think there you, you, for product polynomials, you get what you just said that this is an interval. And so if that's, if that's true, then it, then it also extends to real stable polynomials. Um, but, but there may be some easier argument for this that I'm just not thinking of. Um, it, it seems like it, it should be an interval in general, but I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, 